Hi, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting with the wonderful Bob Horn. How are you, mate? How you doing, man? Good to see you. Thanks for coming through. Thank you. Now, we're at Echo Bar Studios. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, who's your business partner here? Eric Rikers. Fantastic. And how long have you and Eric known each other? Uh, 1998. Yowza. So yeah. coming on 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, we actually uh, were in Tennessee together, uh, became friends through a, a mutual uh, Berkeley uh, alumni that I, I uh, was friends with at, at school and I've uh, been friends ever since. We actually moved out here in 2001 and kind of did our own engineering careers and wow. in 2011 decided to build this place. Oh, so you've had it since 2011? Yeah. This yeah. is fantastic. Now, I've been here a number of times before. Mm. I came here when Lewitt were doing their thing with Kenny Anoff because right. Kenny's a good friend of mine. Mm. and. Uh, and of course, we came and interviewed Dave here recently, and yeah. you know Dave Pensado, as you guys probably know, um, works out of here as well. Right. Yeah. And it's a great, great studio. And this is your room. Do you have a name for your room? No, studio B. <laughs> studio B. We're in Studio B. Uh, um, and you were telling me earlier, so you you mix in a hybrid fashion. Yeah, it's about. Uh, well, in the end, the only thing there's only two things left: analog, because I print everything else once I'm satisfied with the sound. So even if I am, you know, using outboard gear, if it's like a LA-2A on a bass, that'll get printed on a track and I commit to it and never look back. And, Great. Um, but I have a Bercasti reverb that I leave live. Um, and then I have a uh, uh, Black Box HG2, which is on my stereo bus, which obviously, obviously I have to leave that live. Um, so I just videotape, you know, with my iPhone. And nice. Put a little video in my Pro Tools folder and, you know. That's perfect. It works. And so. you, are you, do you have an assistant with you? Are you doing this all on your own? Uh, I, I have assistants occasionally. Um, when, I, when I'm double booking myself, I, I have a, a couple guys that I bring in. Um, most of the time I'm by myself because I just like the freedom of I'll wake up and, you know, go to lunch with a potential client and not even get here till 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to leave an assistant sitting here since 9 a.m., you know. So I can I can just on the cuff decide oh I'm gonna go meet somebody at their studio and you know do you know kind of schmooze and talk to people and then come back here at four p.m. and dive into a mix and then and probably work till two in the morning yeah and then take a nap and then wake up at five and mix and then go home and have breakfast and then sleep and then come back at eleven and right. you know and I, I kind of prefer that rather than every day we're gonna get there at eleven and work and you know right it, it allows me to not be in a cave and uh isolated from the world you know like i still get to interact with people and wonderful yeah so you're working your daw's pro tools yep yeah. um and uh, let's, let's sort of have a let's get around a little bit and see how your what your setup is yeah i uh i kind of it kind of looks like a mastering room um i just i got this desk from my partner eric kind of a hand-me-down and i kind of like it when when i installed these osbergers speakers uh, we may, had them freestanding rather than soffit mounted in the wall, and the combination of a minimal desk with these speakers is just tremendous in this room. I'll be blunt; these are not these speakers are not going to be something that every every guy at home is going to be able to afford. These and uh, these are very expensive speakers, but I do want to talk about them because um, they're kind of I don't know if it's taking the world by storm, but there's a lot of guys that are moving over to them. Yeah, um, Dave Malikpour, who uh, is the owner of professional audio design in Boston. He acquired all the all the uh, Osberger blueprints, I believe, and oh, well. and the permission to manufacture them. And um, they're so they're Osberger design built by PAD, and uh, <clears throat> they have they have these amps over here, Class D amps, very uh, efficient, very fast, and they have um, USB ports in them. Oh, wow. So what you do is you sweep the room, you hook up a, a laptop or your desktop, and you can EQ and then store it on flash RAM. That way you can have different EQ presets or Fantastic. Um, you're just storing the, the EQ inside the amp, which is it's kind of nice. But um, they we were able to get them so in tune to the room that this kind of became an Osberger showroom oh, fantastic. Uh, over here in LA because uh, I was, for a while, I was the only person with them. Right. And then Tom Lord Alge had a pair in Miami. So those were kind of the two places that you go to hear them. And, uh, now, yeah, a bunch of guys have uh, have purchased them um, all over the world. Australia, I think Dr. Dre has two or three pairs. 
um, bigger than mine. <laughs> yours, have, yours are big enough, but apparently yeah. you can get bigger still. <laughs> oh yeah, they have uh, quad 15s with 418s. You can you can go crazy, wow. and I uh, can get them in any color you want. But they're actually so um, sensitive. I use them uh, almost as my exclusive speaker. I don't mix on near fields. Wow. I can mix very very whisper quiet and hear all the reverb tails and everything. Um, much different than you know you go into one of the famous big studios. Sure. Those uh, in a lot of places are, are strictly for volume. And Absolutely. They're, these, they're just to blow away the band or the A&R. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these will definitely do volume, but accurate all over, you know. Yes, I was here, when I was here a few weeks ago, you played me back stuff. I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe how detailed the mid-range was. Yeah. It's, for big speakers, that's the one thing they usually don't do for me. Right, right. Exactly. That's why we like, you know, Gentle X, NS10s, and yeah. they were always for about the mid-range. Yeah. But, I have a... <laughs> I have NS tens back here. I know that, this is fun on stands, but uh, yeah, I'd, honestly, I, I've I've gotten away from them. I kind of use the Ospergers and this. If you look over here, this Marshall, that's a Bluetooth speaker. Um, that's crazy. Yeah, it looks like a little guitar amp, but it actually sounds really good. And I'll check mixes through that, and then uh, got my trusty blue headphones and great. And then lastly, these Aventones. So. And you like the Aventones? I've seen a few people with those. Yeah, I mean, I don't rely on them a lot. I'll just kind of listen to it and see what it's what the vibe is, you know. Absolutely. Um, but I, I I use I use these for checking. You know, if there's too much bass in here, you know it right away. Right. So that's a good thing. And then I think I would have a pair of old iPhone five earbuds hanging over there. I'll check occasionally. Oh, God bless the earbuds. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, that Marshall looks really, really cool, do not Yeah, they actually sell them at the Mac store. And they do? I highly recommend it because it has an analog input, and also it's one of the few Bluetooth speakers that has bass and treble control because wow. I find a lot of the, the little speakers out there are boomy, and you can't adjust anything. So, and it looks really cool. And it looks cool. <laughs> Perfect for the studio. So um, there's some real fun stuff in it. Let's, let's, let's focus on the two things you were talking about oh, okay. first. So this this is uh, you were yeah. saying a two bus. Yeah, that's um, it's basically uh, it's made by Black Box Audio, uh, Eric Racy. Um, there's basically just a bunch of uh, tubes and transformers in there, and uh, I don't want to try to explain it too well because he does a much better job. But I hear you. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's got a saturation circuit with. Uh, flat low and high so if you if you put it on high and push the saturation you basically are distorting the high end and, and you pair are parallel mixing that into the regular signal oh so you're mixing in parallel uh, so it actually gets brighter but kind of in a harmonic way rather than strictly eq and then uh there's a pentode circuit triode circuit the triode helps me get more rms the more i crank that i, I kind of get a couple of db extra in volume which is nice um, and what's the air control do? The air control, the way it was explained to me is it, it's kind of a boost starting at 10K and by the time it gets to 20K, it's 3dB, so it's but a, it's not a shelf. Right, so, so it's, it's not a shelf. And, and it's not a, a straight EQ circuit. And he, hmm. it was explained to me once, but it went right over my head. So uh, I hear you, trust yeah, me. I have to read the manual, I guess, on that one. But it sounds great. You I was know, about to say, look, gotta, what does it sound like? Here? You got a mix that just needs that last bit of little high end uh, you know, you just pop that in and it's like, oh, it's just, it's just a better button. It's, all, it's just push it, it's better. So, <laughs> but that ends up on about 90% of my mixes. Occasionally, I'll bypass it and, and the cleaner. And I suppose, uh, fit, but. I'm assuming this is this is when you're just trying to glue it all together. Kind of, yeah. It's, man, it's just it's just a, a vibe box. It's, it's, it's kind of why I was so into it is it just didn't do anything that anything else did it's, it's its own beast and you can push it hard and and get it really you know you take an indie rock song and right. you just go crazy on the pinto and triode just getting a little bit of you know distortion really and fantastic uh yeah it's, it's a fun box you in our digital world we're always looking for things to just kind of screw it up a bit yeah exactly because exactly. the records we grew up listening to yeah. right i mean i've and i've put it on individual instruments and just saved horrible sounds before i had a uh I had an acoustic guitar once uh, a few months back that was just DI, ugly, the, you know, just recorded it completely the wrong way, put it through that thing, and it just came out a whole other animal, you know. Just, Fantastic. And I had, before that, I had tried 15 plugins, and nothing was working, you know. So, right. 
That's cool. Times when hardware wins, that's great. Yeah. Now, the next thing you were talking about was the M7 here, the Brocasti. Yeah, the Brocasti, uh, fairly well-known reverb unit. It's, um, it's got more processing than, you know, Pro Tools HDX card. It's, it's actually this long when you put it in the rack. It's got so much processing in it. Fantastic. But um, it sounds just really great. And I'm all one for plugins. I use so many and I, I support them. And I'm never one to say, I don't really care about comparing an LA-2A to an LA-2A plugin. They're just different tools. Sure. And but no I, two LA-2As sound the same. I will say this sounds really, really good compared to plugin reverb. Um, not that there aren't great plug-in reverbs, but it's, yeah, it's, it's really cool. Sounds really good. I usually reserve that for my lead vocals. Right. Yeah. When that came out a few years ago, I remember Vintage King took them and were just like telling me, I, you have to hear this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a lot of guys have them. Um, I want, I want to get another one, but, uh, the cool thing is one of the guys who used to work at Bercasti, uh, I believe it's Exponential Audio now makes a plug-in that you can send a MIDI cable to the unit and you strap the plug-in on right before you uh, put this as an insert, and you can adjust all the parameters, automate them, store them, fantastic. and everything. So now I don't even have to recall it. I just open the session and everything's back. That's fantastic. As well as automation, like a plug-in, so that's that's great. Yeah, that's that's very smart. A lot of people moving into that. There's a company called Mimas doing that as well with compressors. Yeah, yeah. Makes life so much easier because the, you know, I'm I'm like you. There's so many plugins that sound incredible. Mm -hmm. But there's also, you know, it's also nice to break out of the box. And I think also it's about creativity. Yeah. You know, it might, it just, the, the, the sort of tactile thing of being able to play with oh, it. Oh, sure. And, yeah. yeah. Can also, yeah. you know, and everybody's different. Now, I want to I wanna go down a few things here. Th this I see a lot, the Kush Audio stuff, the yeah. Clairphonics. Um, I know Joe Ciccarelli uses. I know Dave has been u using these. Yeah. Um, that thing is just, it's that sweet, professional sounding high end that a lot of us struggle to get and you you know you might through the years find that one plugin that has that really great high end that the other plugins kind of seem sure to not have and this is this is kind of that it's like just the perfect sounding uh you know high, high frequency box you know no i hear what you mean there's so so many times with plugins i'll, I'll boost the top end and I'm like, yeah, it sounds brighter, but it also sounds harsher. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just exactly. that harshness. And then when you find something that makes it feel brighter, and that's why I feel like, you know, Poltex traditionally always won everything. Right. Poltex, yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. When, when we had only outboard gear and you wanted that sheen, you'd go over to a Poltex and you'd be like, oh, there it is. Right. There's the brightness and the air that I want. And this, this you could almost think of as, I think every band is shelf, if I'm not mistaken, or at least two of the bands are shelf. They're all boost only, um, so it's kind of a a shelf pull tech, if you will, that has that goes above sixteen k, you know, wow. um, where the pull tech is, you know, just a a bell band. But um, yeah, it, it sounds sounds tremendous. It's great on uh, oh, I'm, I'm, a lot of things. Some guys use it on their two bus. It's a little extreme for me on my two bus. You can. Just you can see where the knobs are set now. I that's, think Chicarelli had it on his two bus when I was. Yeah, in, in that's a pretty there. that's aggressive an aggressive setting right there. I mean, if you get over here, it's insane. <laughs> insane. <right? laughs> but you know, acoustic guitars. I love it on grand piano. Grand piano, you get that clarity and the you know the high keys. It's just it's just magical on those. And then, are you when you're going out to stuff like this? Are you then printing that back in so it's permanently there? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. As opposed to running it the whole yeah. time. Yeah. That's perfect. Um, so that's kind of your process. You have you have this on your vocal most of the time, if not all the time, and yeah. then this on your two bus most of the time. Yeah. Um, and then your cherry picking Everything other else things. Everything will get printed. Um, yeah. One just for ease, so I don't have to recall so many things when I I'll jump you know between three four sessions a day, mm -hmm. just doing tweaks or mixing. Um, and the more I have to recall, the longer it takes to open that session. You know, just even to hit play for somebody. You know, so I understand. Yeah. Now the Manly uh, um, Poltec EQs. Yeah, those I've had uh, since I first started engineering. Um, uh, I kind of reserve those for acoustic guitars and drum overheads, and honestly, mostly when I'm when I track, which I don't do that often anymore. But um, they're great EQs. Um, there's there's a lot of plugins out there that that kind of do the same thing. So it's kind of one of those things where. 
if I'm in the mood to, like you said, get tactile with some knobs and yep. uh, I'll, I'll dive into them a lot of times, so, you know, plugins work, work good too. What's the Moog on the top here? That's uh, an old Bob Moog uh, EQ. It's just a three band. It's kind of dirty. <laughs> I think it even has a drive knob on it and that, that actually belongs to Dave Pensato. Uh, he just loaned it to me kind of indefinitely. <laughs> so, I, do you get to use it on much? Uh, I, I try it on live bass sometimes and about half the time it works and you know it's just it, it has its sweet spots definitely not not every band sounds great in in every frequency so sometimes it's the perfect thing and other times it's oh that didn't work move on right you know? yeah it's nice to have extra toys to play with yeah um oh you know, this this is great now i i'm starting to see people with 1998s a lot more now, which is, I think is fantastic, because I loved the console when they made it. Yeah, a lot of people have never touched that console. They just didn't make it for long enough, apparently. Right, but it had had a lower noise floor than digital audio tape. It, it was like negative 100 something. It was it's crazy. crazy. Brad, Brad, uh, Brad Wood has a couple of these and swears by them. Yeah. And I remember in Olympic, they had a room with the console with the 1998. Uh, yeah, and yeah Steve, that, that's my recording stuff. chain, basically. Oh, uh, wow. That and then a compressor. Um, a lot of times a daking compressor, but yeah, that's, that's, I love the EQ on it. It's, it's like nothing else out there. That's kind of my thing is, is getting gear that there's nothing else like it. You know, there's no plugin that makes the sound of it. You know, I like right. collecting that kind of gear. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a phenomenal EQ, a lot of options for band. It's got like sheen and glow knobs, which Rupert explains in his manuals, but I always forget exactly what they mean, but Yes, but do they sound good? Fiddle That's with them until it sounds yeah, really cool. Sounds great, and the pre is great as well. You know, That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah I, I I remember uh, uh, Steve Fitzmorris, who's a fantastic mixer, who mixed uh, you know Seal. What is it? Sure. The name of the rose or whatever. Yeah. He he mixes on, or he was mixing a lot on a 1998 over an Olympic when I when I was back there in the late uh, 90s, and uh, that's when I discovered what they were. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that that console was, even though it was AMEC, it was Rupert Neve designing right. for AMEC. And so people that didn't like AMEC just dismissed it yeah. right away. But it's actually a phenomenal console and very quiet, very musical sounding. Fantastic. Yeah. And now we were just talking about Peter Reardon and Shadow Hills. Yeah. So that is the, the actually the base unit for the Oculus. Um, so this, you plug all the connections into this and then this ends up being your volume knob, uh, mute, uh, it's got five sources, which I like, so I can have main mix, rough mix, reference mixes, uh, iTunes, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. Great. Um, and then over here you have your speaker selector, so Osbergers, NS10s, Aventones, and then also uh, your talkback and damn and mono, mono selection. And this is all USB? Uh, it's actually Bluetooth. And it's, oh, it is? It's plugged in. It charges from an Ethernet. Oh, I see. Charges from an Ethernet. You can actually walk around with it, hand, hand it to the A and R guy, whatever you want. You know, and, that's uh, dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's a great idea. But you that's say, where hey, the, the earplugs come in. <laughs> hand that to them, and you put the. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, I saw this at uh, at uh, AES this year. Very that's clean. Uh, it, it's not a potentiometer. It's actually switches, so you can actually hear. Oh, that's great. So it's actually switching from a different volume to another volume rather than right. a resistor. So it's about the cleanest path you can have for audio and monitor. In, in the BBC, I have uh, an old friend of mine who was a BBC engineer for years before they, they basically let them all go and now they're all independent. Mm. And he would always tell me that. He'd tell me that all of their stuff was detented, that they never had uh, right. continuously variable pots. He said that... It, I'm not an electronics engineer, but he gave me a whole reason why it doesn't sound as good uh -huh. for exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah. Everything was stepped. Yeah. A lot of young guys don't, I, I think they kind of look at some of the gear like a Neve 1073 or API 550 and wonder why can't I get that half dB thing? Yep. And that's what it is. It's not It's not a knob. It's, I mean, it's not a potentiometer. It's, it's actually a switch, yep. you know, and it's higher quality auto, audio. Yep. but trading off for less selections of frequencies and volume, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. There's some sweet spots on a need though, so I kind of like the wrongness. If it's wrong, it's right for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, Joe Meek. That's I, a that's SC 2.2. 2.2. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I have, I've had that since college. That's my, my favorite thing that, that they ever made. Um, 
I, I used to use it on two bus and then I kind of started using it on piano and honestly now I don't really use it that often. I might, I might track through it a little bit, maybe overheads or something like that. Um, but I just couldn't get my, you know, I couldn't, couldn't part with it. Couldn't part with it. So, no, I totally hear it. Yeah. I hear you. Uh, the <clears throat> LA2A? LA2A, yeah. Just kind of standard, you know, tube compressor, you know. Are you using it on a vocal if you pair it? Um, not really. I'll I'll use that on, uh, what I like to use it on, it, it has kind of a low mid bump to it. That, that I, I mean, I hate using that word warm, but it definitely warms things up. My favorite thing is for uh, like a squeaky saxophone, you know, that was just could have had a better mic used, you know, it's just too thin. That that thing can definitely give it some body that's Great. missing. Uh, easier than trying to EQ it. So stuff like that, <clears throat> things that are thin that I want to thicken up a little bit. Great. Um, and then immediately below. So this is a new company called Locomotive Audio out of Missouri. And um, I have two pieces of theirs. I have a dual preamp and then this mono compressor. And this compressor, it's, it's insanely built on the inside. It, 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 it's beautiful, just hand built, um, has transformers on the back that are like this big. Wow. It's, it's a really beautiful piece of gear. I'd have to say it sounds somewhere between a stay level and an Altec compressor. Um, those, those are both nice references. Yeah, but they, uh, the thing is it's, it's almost, it's almost like a stay level with infinite release and attack, you know? Right. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a lot more flexible, definitely has a tone to it. And I love that. I love gear that has, that changes the sound just running through it. I, I think that's a great thing. Um, but also it has, you know, a modern, uh, high pass filter, you know, which, which is, is great. great. You know, I've yeah. even used it on kick drum and it done, I've gotten some cool sounds out of it. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, the, new, the retro 1176, the 176. Yeah. Yeah. All the, it's great that guys are going back and getting the sound of the tubes but they're adding a, t a faster attack and release times. Right. Because that's right. what unfortunately sucks about this, as you know. Sure. If you've got a super fast vocal, it's still like, <coughs> oh, I'm just coming back. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I used to pick gear on, based on speed. So yeah. fast tempo song with a fast vocal, you use a vac rack. Yeah. Slow song, you use a stay level or LA-2A. Right. You know, so tempo and compression were a lot more hand in hand yeah. 15 years ago. Um, As I think that's where, for many of us, 1176 always won because it was the only thing that had a fast enough attack and release. Yeah. You know. Yeah, or, or even uh, the now nowadays uh, distressor, yeah, distressor can be yeah. slow or fast or yeah. anything in between. So a lot of people dig that. Yeah, definitely. And a distressor, I can make it sound like a DBX 160 or 1176. Mm -hmm. That's what's pretty remarkable sure. about it. So we talked briefly, uh, you mentioned earlier, the Day Kings. I'm a big fan of Jeff Day Kings. Yeah, stuff. these are some of my favorite compressors ever uh they're fet solid state compressors um they have an attack time of a quarter millisecond so which is extremely fast for an analog piece of gear um they have ratios from 1.5 all the way up to 20 um and then their releases are based on uh times from famous compressors and i don't remember the list but it's got like a ad complex and then fairchild 670 and then Neve 33609 kind of their preset releases um and it's just it's a beautiful compressor like when i track through it i'll i'll crush a vocal 7 to 10 db and you don't hear artifacts like you don't hear pumping and breathing and all that stuff well wow. it's just like an automatic vocal ride and it's it's a really cool thing that's um, fantastic as a stereo pair it's actually really great on the two bus um the only thing i wish it had was a side chain filter on the on the low end but um this is the first model there's no actually uh two space all in one stereo unit and that might have it i'd, I'd have to check but jeff's stuff is fantastic yeah he's just for those guys that don't know the thing about jeff is he's so understated like an aes this year yeah he had like <laughs> his gear like with somebody else in a booth but yeah. everybody that knows and uses jeff gate daking stuff thinks it's some of the best stuff I've ever made yeah absolutely Got his it. preamps are really cool too his preamps are insane barisi uh when i was talking to barisi he 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 and i both agreed that the, his trident i don't know if he's allowed to call it the trident but his trident mic pre that he made mm -hmm. whatever 25 years ago whatever yeah he, is probably still one of the best selling mic pre's ever made. yeah but totally understated he's just like oh yeah yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no ego involved in this stuff which is 
Very refreshing. And what do we have down here? So the last ah, thing is actually two things. It's uh, These are half space units. So there's two of them. Um, they're stereo. These are uh, Overstayer is the name of the company. And these are his FET compressor. Uh, and they're stereo. So you got four channels here. Um, oh, fantastic. And uh, Jeff is a, he's a great guy, genius of a, of a audio gear builder. And um, he's right down the street in Studio City and makes a ton of gear. And you can go by his place and see. You'll see cool stuff that may never come out, but he's just fooling with it. And then other stuff will be coming out in a couple months. And this this compressor I really was drawn to, again, because I hadn't heard anything else that does what this does. Um, I highly recommend... Um, I honestly recommend just buying it. And if you don't like it, I'll buy it from you because <laughs> I wouldn't mind having more of them. They're, they're awesome. They just... Wow. They That's... crush... <laughs> You can you can do a severe like drum compression and it just sounds awesome like really cool different um, it's got like a this dirt button and grit button and and uh, um, I don't know you know it's just a fun piece of gear it's just great to get on and and dial up and I've uh, <coughs> I don't know if you know that what's that Sarah Brella song love song yeah with that really compressed piano yeah it does that kind of thing really well wow I really just kind of grabby and um <clears throat> slightly distorted if you want and really cool um i know some I, guys use them on their two bus uh it's a little little much for me on the two bus but uh yeah it's a really fun piece of gear that's fantastic yeah yeah you, you know you're the second or third person that's told me how amazing those are so yeah i have to get them yeah, just just buy one. If you don't like it, let me know. And I love that. Maybe that's I'll that's, get it from that's you. a damning indictment <laughs> if ever I heard it. And it positive, positively, uh, positive indictment. Well, this if stuff ever heard is it. Um, uh, pretty much for tracking. Uh, so I, I just have. Um, Bunch yeah, when I was and... when I was here when you were tracking drums uh, with Kenny, yeah, you were raving about these two. So let's start. Those with are these classic two. API. Eric knows more about these. Um, but they're basically recreations of uh, API VP26 preamps. And what I love about them is that compared to like the 512 is you have an output knob. So if you want to drive like your toms really hard and then dial back the output, you can get uh, have them hitting the transformers really hard and Great. get a really cool sound. Or if you want to go clean, dial the preamp conservative and then turn the output really high, you know. Great. Yeah, I know you were loving these when... Uh... Uh, when, when you're working yeah they're i mean you could give me 14 of those and i'll just do drums with those they're 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 perfect they're great wonderful yeah. uh what's the precision at the top here so that's uh true systems it's just uh that was a quick eight preamps that are nice and clean um uh that just helped me get started with a bunch of preamps being mostly a mixer i hadn't been collecting pre's so right. just uh be able to put a few keyboards and <clears throat> Hi hat mics, talkback mics, and stuff. Then they're they're really good sounding pre, uh, with kind of no frills. Perfect. Um, and then the Millennia. Millennia, super clean. Um, when you want like a, a, you know, that's that opposite of a ten seventy three sound, just kind of a clear window volume knob. That's the perfect pre for that. Some transient designer. Are you? Yeah, four channel transient designer. Still um, using them or are you using? Yeah, plugins? actually, that's one thing where I think the the plugins have never, never nailed it. I think those those the plugins work maybe sixty percent of the time, and those work one hundred percent. So, um, I think the analog transient it sounded like designer, a Zoolander. Uh, look, look, Zoolander uh, Anchorman. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> works. <laughs> works. Was it works one hundred percent of the time, sixty percent of the time? Yep. <laughs> so yeah, the, yeah. I mean, those things are are yeah. great. Um, yeah, I funny still enough, have mine on a kick and snare rack and floor. Yeah. Uh, funny enough, a lot of guys uh, are getting such good drum sounds. Uh, I don't need them that often anymore unless it's live drums, you know? Right. Crazy. And then <coughs> you were talking about this earlier. The... Yeah, so the same guy that makes this locomotive compressor, he makes this preamp. Uh, it's a stereo or a dual mono preamp. And um, kind of the same thing as the API. You have your uh, level knob and your gain, so all the tubes and transformers in it, you crank that gain up, you're just going to get this really colored sound to it. And Perfect. I love the switchable impedance here. Yeah, yeah. It's got it's got all the options you want. It's great. Low-cut. DI for bass. Or, um, yeah. I had a uh, 
Moog Voyager keyboard, uh, going into that and just analog heaven, you know, just really cool sound. And then these, uh, how do you pronounce this? Is this Mog? Mag? Mog. Yeah, Cliff Mog. Um, the old, he was part of the old NTI EQ. I don't know if you remember those, the light blue. I do, yeah. Um, so he's got all these new 500 series units. Um, that one is the Pre-Q2. It's got the air band. Uh, so you can boost 40K, all that kind of stuff. And um, this is a straightforward preamp, you know. Um, those are really cool. I, I like those. What I like doing is um, if, if you're going to cut a song, let's say an R&B song with like 100 vocals, cut the leads and the ad libs with like. You said that very factually, like that, with like a hundred votes. Yeah, yeah. Because no, it no happens. Joke there. There, there's no joke there. <laughs> you know, cut the leads and the and the ad libs with something warm and big and fat, making the vocal seem bigger than life, and then cut all your backgrounds with something nice and clean, like the Millennia or the Mog, and it just comes together so much because you're not making every one of those hundred vocals over oversized. You know, you can. They're nice and clean and it's great. defined. I, I, I have a similar, uh, that's a great idea. Um, I have a similar thing I do with the, um, that 940. Remember the LCT 940? Yeah. You, you can go tube or FET. Sure. Just all the way over to tube for the lead, all right. the way down to FET for uh, the back. Yeah, I never thought of that. That's a good idea. Because it has like the hardness with the FET and then the warmth and the openness yeah, with, yeah. The, with the tube. Um, so that's great. And then the focus right? Yeah, that's. Uh, Basically, the old Red One, they now started making 500 series modules. Great idea. And uh, I think it sounds really cool. Um, I actually wish I had a second one. It's, it's, it's really nice. That's perfect. And then That radial. is basically a radial uh, box send and return for guitar pedals. Um, oh, I see. So if I get a boring guitar or whatever, tambourine, vocal, if there's anything I want to send through a guitar pedal, you just send out a one jack and return, and then you got... You have send and return volumes, so you can kind of gain, gain stage it perfectly. And then you have a mix knob, which is awesome. So you can actually- What a freaking great idea. Yeah, I can use something and like I the Qtron. I love his setup here, so he's got, yeah, it's just all ready to go. Uh, so you use something like the Qtron, but then mix it only like a little bit. And it's it's kind of cool. That's really smart. Yeah. Now I've got to talk to radio, because I, yeah. I want to get that. <laughs> I, I've, I've always been a re big radio fan. The yeah. DIs are phenomenal. And it's built, they're like, uh, as we say in England, it's built like a brick shit house. Yeah. They're just like really well, simple, <laughs> well made stuff, you know? Oh, yeah. You yeah. pick up a DI of radials and it's like, wow, this is substantial. Oh, yeah, we have, we've got a bunch of them. Yeah. Those things are heavy. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, let's have a quick look over here and talk a little bit about your, your, your setup. I love the fact you have a space echo here. Yeah, tape echo. You can't beat those. Uh, again, nothing sounds like them. The, uh, the UAD. Um, replication is, is pretty fun, but the real thing is the real thing, you yeah. know. Fantastic. Actually, like, sending something through it to delay and re record it on a new track, but as it's going, actually sit here with the uh, intensity knob and just, just barely move it up and down as slow as you can, you know. Right. It, it just kind of creates this warble that you just barely notice, but it's, it's really it's fun to do that. That's perfect. Yeah. I love stuff like that. I have an Echoplex, but the Space Echo is oh, like okay. definitely the next level up. <laughs> the Echoplex does that one thing fantastically. Yeah, the space yeah, Echo. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That was like, when I was a kid, that was like, wow, you have a Space Echo. Like, you know, <laughs> we had uh, Wem copycats. Yeah, yeah. Which is like an open, you know, the open face reels and sure. stuff like that. And Echoplexes, those were all used really inexpensive, but the Space Echoes were always uh. like, oh, the Holy Grail. <laughs> um, so you're using Apogees? Yeah, uh, I got this, this, my original rig I got back in 2007, and at that time, uh, Avid was DigiDesign, and there weren't, there were a lot less third-party interfaces than there are now. Now there's a whole ton, but um, I had been in a studio, and, and uh, they had 192s, and we were tracking vocals, and they had a two-channel Apogee, and the assistant asked me if I wanted to send the vocal through it, and uh, I'd never done that, so we actually molted it and did an AB, and I like the Apogee so much better. Um, so when I decided to buy my own rig, I decided just to do that for all the ins and outs. So I did uh, 32 in, 32 out, and um, now that Avid has, has taken over, they their new interfaces are actually pretty top notch, and and as well as you know, there's Prism and 
uh, Lynx Aurora. There's a lot of good ones out there. The now. Bell, I've been hearing yeah. about. Yeah. Of course, Lavery we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Lavery. Some but yeah, ones. at the time, I was definitely enjoying having a better sounding rig than, than a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of other people just having those Apogees, so. Great, well, this is fantastic stuff. Let's check out the studio. Okay. Are these all yours? Uh, these are a joint collection of Eric's and my guitars. Fantastic. Uh, a guitar player. Oh, you've got a little, a little three quarter Rickenbacker. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Bought that out of a trunk of someone's car that was unfortunately doing very bad and needed the money and oh, I got it for 500 bucks. <laughs> wow, I love that. So I like to brag about that. Is that a 330? I think it's 330. 330. Yeah. That is absolutely yeah. gorgeous. That's, it's just a tone machine. This is like six awesome sounds you can get out of it <laughs> instead of the usual three. Dave was telling me, Pensada was telling me that you're an amazing musician. Oh. <laughs> Dave's That's, an awesome guy. Yeah, that was very... Uh, he, um, he speaks very highly of your, your musicality. Eric just got that. Uh, that's an actually 1962 uh, Jaguar, and it has flat wounds on it. The original. That is really a 62. Yeah, pre CBS. Almost, almost mint condition. Yeah, it was, it was. It's the classic. His father-in-law's attic stored in there since college. Oh. Yeah. Uh, is that custom shot? Um, yeah. Strat. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Then, I, is that a silver tone? What is that crazy looking that's thing? That's a. Up there? Uh, that's a Dan Electro. Um, oh, Dan Electro. I think it's just called the Pro. I bought that and then five minutes later dropped it down a flight of stairs and it survived. But it's got <laughs> a bunch of stickers on the back to cover the scratches. That's a crazy looking thing. That thing's great. It's like 10 dB louder than any guitar, other guitar. So it just drives the amp really hard. And it has lipstick pickups? Yeah. You can scream into them and hear yourself. Oh, that's fantastic. Love that jazz bass. Yeah. The Ricky. Okay, so I've got to ask, what are these? So these are, I used to make, my dad and I used to make guitars and basses. This one my dad made on his own, and that one I made in high school wood shop. Um, and then all the others that we've made, I, I've gotten rid of at this point, or there's a couple at home. But um, yeah, it was just kind of a hobby of ours, just to make, make guitars and basses. So let's, uh, let's check out the live room. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Nice. So... Uh, did you, did you have this purpose built? So this was basically behind? was a wide open warehouse, 3,000 square feet. It had the two bathrooms and that was it. Everything else we've done from scratch. So wow. this was concrete with a garage door, which is no longer there. And um, Eric and I basically designed it, built it, and did the acoustic treatment. Uh, acoustic treatment we did by ear and just by past experience in other studios, what we knew worked and didn't work. I think for live rooms, and this is a humble experience, a humble opinion, and everybody can disagree. That's quite all right. You have to agree with me. <laughs> my, my, I had a live room that I really loved that we built, and it was same thing: trial and error. We moved panels around, and probably real guys, which I'm not, but if a real guy came in, they probably would have told me I did it wrong. But I liked how I could make it sound. Yeah, yeah. Now this is, I mean, and I just by trial and error and accident, it's my favorite drum room. I mean, great. Uh, and I'm just I'm proud that we own it because it's uh, I don't want to do drums anywhere else. It just came out perfect. And for my old studio, we had about 96 panels of uh, John Mansville, the compressed fiberglass, and we just started laying it in different places in the room, and then play the drums, and then move it, and play the drums. And um, the ceiling is something I've always wanted to do, <clears throat> just to break up parallel reflections from the floor. Great. And uh, just turned out sounding really, really it cool. It looks beautiful as well, which helps. It's a beautiful um, looking room. These uh, bass traps Eric came up with, and it was remarkable because it, it took him about probably four hours to build each one, and you would talk in here, and then four hours later, come back and talk again, and even with that four hours, you'd notice a severe difference, like all the bass just tightened up, just in your own speech. So there's two of them, one in each corner. And then these, these panels, you can take these out and uh, flip them over or, or just remove them. Right. And basically, if you take all 12 of them out and put them in the hallway, you get another about half second of reverb. So it, it's insane in here. It sounds like twice as big as it looks. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So done out definitely on a few uh, rock records. And 
Is the TV up so you can communicate with the other rooms? Yeah, so we, it's because we have two control rooms feeding the same live room, and glass is expensive and makes your room sound horrible. We went with cameras and flat I screens. I like that. Glass is expensive and makes, and makes your, your room, room sound horrible. Sound horrible. And I can limiting. attest to that. And limiting, yeah. you know, I, being, you know, that we do so much editing and mixing, yep. I want my screen basically where the window used to be. Mm -hmm. And so then what do you do? You put the control window on the side and yep. now you get this weird side reflection. So I just modern forward thinking, you know. Yeah. Um, and and so... So you've got the drummer and he can see you working yeah, you can, and vice versa. We can turn the camera, turn the screen. Uh, there's a screen in the booth if the, the singer, if they want to see the control room or if they want to see the drummer or they want to see someone else, you know. Great. So we have little video patch bays in our rooms. Perfect. I've yeah. been in here when he was recording Kenny Anoff and it sounded fantastic. So yeah. it's a great sound room. Um, and Kenny yeah. can hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. Yeah. It's like uh, I, I did a record with him recently. Oh. And uh, the artist was like, I want to change the snare sound. And I'm like, well, uh, <laughs> you know where I'm going. It's like when Kenny hits that snare, every mic in the whole of the, w within a thousand miles of this uh, building oh, yeah. is hearing that snare. Yeah. And it's like, it, 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 it's very consistent. Look at that. You've got a 940. Yeah. Um, just talk, and that, this is not planned. We are just talking about the LCT 940 and there it is. Yeah, actually, Eric is, uh, he's working with an artist, Rasan Patterson right now, and, and they really like the 940 on his voice. Wonderful. We, uh, we use the 16 channel Furman's, which it's great if, if you're building a studio, having mixers for the artist is, it's, or especially a band, just so they're not arguing over, turn me up, turn me down, turn the guitar down, you know, everyone can do their own mix and, uh, I think it's life a, a lot easier on the engineer. Yeah, I agree. And I think exactly it makes life easier. And I would say um, the one thing I've learned from talking experience and talking to pretty much every producer and engineer like yourself is that if the artist doesn't have a good headphone mix, it doesn't really matter what you're doing because that can be right. the biggest deal, the biggest problem. I, yeah. I know, um, you know, um, Steven Tyler live is obsessed about his mix. Uh -huh. And he's got in-ears and stuff like that. And he makes his, <laughs> I've been in their rehearsals, he makes his monitor engineer automate effects. Wow. He's like, I want it to be like the record. He's like, if I'm going, yeah, and he had a huge verb, he goes, I want to hear that. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, those are guys that have been doing it for 40 plus years. And, mm -hmm. and you'd think that, you know, by now anything would do. And, and, and in some instances it is, you know, they're, right. they're very professional and they can get around anything. But you're right, you, you artists need to be inspired. Yeah. This is another thing I like, um, Audio Technicas. Uh, when I, um, th when I, uh, we interviewed Barry Rudolph, I just, because, you know, he, he's a gear reviewer, you know, he reviews everything. Yeah. And I said to him, I was like, what's the best headphones for the money? And he just went, Audio Technica, without a, a, a break. Uh. And I think that's great because they do make incredibly affordable and expensive headphones, but yeah. their affordable ones sound really, really good. Actually, so like having not... having as many brands as far as the the most common ones. So we have the Sony's, we have the buyers uh, that people like. We have. Do you have the DT one hundred buyers? The, the yeah. gray ones. Yeah. Oh, and then we have the seventy five oh sixes. Seventy five oh sixes, and then uh, I think we have one pair left of the old AKGs that I oh yeah that I used to like. You know. Yeah. Um, Seven forties. What was it, the Fostex, the last ones? Or Sennheisers, the last ones we had, yeah. So we have a few, you know, so. It's a good idea, because if yeah. somebody comes in and they're like, I really love the, you mean these? Well, what's funny <laughs> is like, for bass players, I will choose them, the buyers. No, no, uh, yeah. Because if you give bass players a pair of Sonys, they turn their tone knob down, because it's overly bright. Yeah. So they think their bass is bright. So then you're in the control room boosting the high end and they're you're fighting each other yeah. because they're listening to Sony's, which it's all string noise. Right. So I give bass players the buyers and it's muffled yeah. almost. Yeah. And so they leave their tone open and flat and then I can get what I want. <laughs> Great idea. So, that's good thinking. Little tricks like that. You know? Yeah, that's, uh, a, that's, that's good experience. Well, it's great, you know. I, I, I might watch this and go, well, what is he really talking about? He's talking about good monitoring. Okay, good monitoring. He's talking about, you know, gluing it together and trying some stuff to make his mix more exciting. I mean, there's just ideas there for yeah. people to latch onto. Yeah, and I mean, you, can switch the, you can switch everything out. You can find a different box than the black box and a different speaker than the Osberger. And we're going to approach it the same way, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's just different tools. It's, you know, when we're... The, the world now is so much more open. Everybody knows about everything. It's like it's when, great. when I was growing up, 
I knew as much as my music store knew. Right. So they didn't have the Bradshaw switching system for a guitar in Cincinnati, sure. Ohio at Buddy Rogers Music. So they didn't have it where I lived either. Strange when, that. <laughs> when I heard about that, I was like, why don't I know about that? Like, why didn't my music store tell me, you know? Yeah. And, and it's like, I, I just knew about the PV stuff and Fender yeah. and, and the standard stuff, you know? And nowadays you're not limited by what your best friend knows. And, you know, it's like your friend gets this pedal. So it's like, oh, I, I didn't know that was out. He found that. Now I can go get that, you know? Yeah. So now everybody just knows about everything. And there's just so many more companies. And um, But it's funny when, when a musician or or a pr producer or composer or engineer, when we find something that works for ourselves, a lot of us start to think that that's the truth and everybody, it should work for everybody mm -hmm. and everybody should do what we're doing. And that's not the case. It's like uh, you mentioned with, with Eddie Van Halen, he, he doesn't have to have his custom guitar to sound like Eddie Van Halen. No, it's you all... know, you don't have to have your studio that you have now to sound like you, you know. It's like you could give me and you a Ramza console with no outboard gear and a couple of effects units and a 16 track Pro Tools unit feeding the console and a pair of speakers we've never used and it'll still sound a lot like us, you know? Absolutely. It's, we're gonna do, we're gonna gravitate towards the same things, the same kind of EQing, the same kind of balancing, you know, just the general sound that we like, we're gonna gravitate towards making that with whatever gear you put in front of us, so. The gear is, is, it's just an enhancement and makes it fun. It's definitely you know. a good, big, big quote and big part of it is actually having some fun. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, uh, a lot of nostalgia as well. For me, I'll be honest, a lot of nostalgia. I have a 12 channel Canuck console. Yeah. And well, you know what I love about it? It has these uh, G320 mic pre's and they had the same mic pre's they had at the, um, at Rockfield where they did Bohemian Rhapsody, a uh. queen of my favorite band. I mean, it's like, it does sound amazing, don't get me wow. wrong, but a huge reason why I have that console is I just want to have that feeling of sure, like, sure. I can get like those queen drum sounds if I want, you know. <laughs> right, right. It, it's kind of bullshit, right. but it's, it, yeah. but at the same time, it's like with mastering guys. I love what you're saying here, by the way. With mastering guys, I go to different mastering guys' places, and I'm sure you've been to many of them, and they have some really funny, crazy, esoteric things. Yeah. And they'll tell you about the different transformers and the pentos and the triodes and the this and the that, and they'll give you a thousand different reasons. And then I will see people debate them as to whether they're right or wrong. And they may be wrong or they may be right, but are they passionate about it? Does it make, right. does, does it make them connect more? Yes, and that's more important. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not what, whether it's right or wrong, it's whether it's right or wrong for you. Yeah. You know, if it helps you get what you want to achieve out of the music, then, you know, that that's all that matters, you know. Uh, I, have, I have this one client who uh, demands I mix at his home studio, which is it's fine. It's a great home studio. But that way, when I leave at night, he can sit there obsessing over fader rides and stuff that, that only he hears, and he knows that. Right. But he'll just sit there, you know, at 4 in the morning, and the next morning I'll come in, and it's a little bit different. But his Pro Tools rig that we mix out of is Pro Tools, I think, 7.1. He doesn't have... Not even 7.4. No. He doesn't have most of the modern plugins, you know, modern being four years later, a few years later. Um, you know, he doesn't have sound toys. He doesn't have a, a lot of the great stuff we like, Decapitator, you oh, know, yeah. just fun plugins. He's yeah. got mostly waves. And Not having Echo Boy. I mean, I couldn't live with Echo Boy. Is so good. Oh, he's got Echo Farm. You know, Echo like, Farm, which actually know. was good. Echo Farm's good. So, but I go there and I just forget about that, and we just make it about the music. So my main EQ ends up being either the Massenberg EQ, which <laughs> thank God he has, or uh, a lot of times I'll use his uh, Renaissance Six EQ. And thinking about that, having to go do that, I I'm bummed. I don't want to go do that. It's like, you know, I want all my plugins. That I got right here that I spent money on that I love. But once I get there and start mixing, it doesn't not sound like me. It still sounds like me. Great. And it's still, we get great mixes and they end up being just as good as stuff I do here. So I, you know, I honestly, <laughs> I completely understand. And to be honest, by default, I, I've been using those Renaissance EQs since, you know, 1857. I, uh, <laughs> I'll still go to those and quickly yeah. use them. Between that and like, does he have Mac, D, Mac DSP? Yeah. 
I think it's on some of those. Yeah, because the good, the yeah. great thing about Mag DSP that I love is you can just kind of generically just make it a little brighter. It's almost like you know what would one of those things you're talking about there. You could just you can just make something brighter on a Mag DSP plugin and go, all oh, right, that's nice. As opposed right. to like detail, it's just sure, sure. Yeah. That's, they're always good yeah. go-to kind of plugins. But yeah, I hear you. It just it just becomes more about the music and less about you know getting everything your heart desires plugin wise and. Um, it still ends up sounding the way we want it to sound. Right. So for him, he's like, well, why should I pay money to upgrade? Even though the next time he calls me, I'm going to say, did you upgrade yet? You should upgrade. <laughs> you know? so. But I think ultimately, um, it's going back to what reinforcing what you're saying. It's kind of an acquired knowledge. Yeah. You get to know when something feels right, when it sounds right in the track. And, yeah. and really, it's just hard work. It's just doing it a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. It's it's like everything matters, and and then again, nothing matters. <laughs> right. What's what's the Chinese? Is, who said it? Confucius. I don't remember who said it, but the <laughs> phrase is "All I know is I know nothing." Right. And I do know that the the older I get, I realize that there's no real rules, and when somebody's telling somebody else they're doing it wrong, yeah, but that's your wrong. And yeah. this guy, he might do that. He might print this tiny little waveform. You know what, if there's something in his chain that does that and it works for him and uh -huh. that he got an amazing vocal performance out of it, the vo amazing vocal yeah. performance is more important than printing it 3 dB less or more. Yeah, yeah. No, you can, you can maybe say that it, it doesn't always have to be right, but uh, if, if, you can, if you can practice good techniques, you should. Right. You know, but if, if something happens where it doesn't work out that one day, perfect then if, if it still gives you the music you want then that's all that's important well look well thank you ever so much i really appreciate it you rock thanks for taking time and explaining your process explaining your equipment showing us echo bar studios anytime is it echo bar studio or studios uh echo bar recording studios echo bar recording studios and we uh we're actually starting construction on four more rooms january 2nd wow so that'll be a six room facility in a few months that's fantastic so, yeah we're going to put the link below so people can go and check okay. out our studio. Cool. And uh, once again, thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate absolutely. it. As ever, please subscribe. Go to producelikeapro.com. Sign up for the email list. But leave some questions and comments below. Um, we didn't even talk about Bob's resume. It's pretty insane. Um, you'll see some scan of some of the records he's done, which are just incredible. Um, he's really talented. I love a... You know what I love about your mixes? Just branking away. You you made me completely rethink some stuff the last time we are here. And I've talked about this a couple of times. And uh, it's making for an interesting outro, but screw it. This is what we're doing. <laughs> um, what I loved about the stuff you were playing me last time is your top end detail was insane. Oh, okay. And this is something I want to share with people. The reason, and I went back and listened to your stuff. I don't know if you're conscious of it, whether you're... you're, you're or, or it's just because you're talented and you hear this, but because your top end de detail is so good, um, it really translates on crappy laptop speakers, yeah. iPhone speakers. Now, I grew up in rock music, you know, and obviously Stevie Wonder and Motown and the Beatles and all that stuff. But I, you know, my bands when I was a kid were rock bands. Queen were my favorite band. Um, but what I notice when I listen to a lot of those records, and even the records of the late 90s and early 2000s, is they do not translate on iPhones and they don't translate on laptops. Sure. Because of that, pss, pss, the symbol's just going crazy. Mm -hmm. And you hear a vocal, and then you hear these symbols going crazy. But when I listen to your mixes, I still hear the symbol. I don't, there's no overpowering symbol in the vocal. The top end detail is so well controlled. Yeah. Was that a conscious thing? I'd say more paranoia than consciousness. <laughs> well, it's conscious, yeah. But uh, from a paranoid perspective. It's great. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I don't know if it's part of your referencing process. I know you said you had earbuds over there. Well, yeah, one thing I didn't mention, uh, when I'm done at the end of the night and I send the mix to the client, I, I send it through Hightail, and they have a Hightail app on the iPhone. So I get home, and whether I'm in, laying in bed about to go to sleep, I listen to it on either my iPhone or iPad right there from the app. Right. Um, so all my mixes for the week are, are in there, and I can just listen to them and compare them. And um, that's one thing I definitely check for. And if I hear something through the I iPhone speaker that doesn't sound like what I'm used to, I'll make a note and the next day adjust it. You know, that's perfect. Um, so that and uh, 
I do a lot of work on on vocal, the high end of the vocals. I'm very, it's very controlled and very out of the way of everything else that's high end. So I make sure that the sibilance isn't clashing with the high end of the hi hat and the shaker, and vice versa, the shaker and the hi hat together, and the top end of an acoustic guitar and the hi hat. And so you kind of same thing with almost with mid range and bass too. It's like it's just balancing everything uh, from an EQ perspective to not conflict. Yeah. Well, it works great because when I went back and when started going through your uh, your resume, it, it was pretty crazy okay. because I heard it in this room, and I remember mentioning it to you briefly, and then I went back and listened, and I think that your excitement in the mix is still there because I think what I've done, and I think many mixers were doing for especially all through the '90s and the 2000s, early 2000s, before you know the wonderful world of iPhones got so crazy and laptops. Is like we were adding three to five K and above in abundance to get the excitement out sure. of the mix, but it does not work on a pair of laptop speakers. Right. It doesn't, right. it suddenly just becomes, yeah. and everything's, everything is exciting, therefore nothing is exciting. Well, one thing, another reason I, I work on that area so much is because I, I want people to be able to listen loud comfortably and it not hurt. In my early days, I worked with producers that listened louder than anyone else wants to. Yep. And it's just all the way up yep. sometimes. And uh, it's just, I'd be in earplugs 12 hours out of the day because the snare is just ripping your head off. Yep. So I started actually crafting my mixes to where it's anything's going to hurt at that level, but it, it, it was a lot more tolerable. And, uh, and just even for myself and earbuds or... I don't want to crank it up and 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 wince and and hate what I'm hearing, uh, unless it's if it's supposed to be that aggressive, then then you do it. But um, you know, I like I like the people to be able to bump it and enjoy it. And, Absolutely. Uh, the louder they can do that without pain, the the cooler it is. <laughs> so. so, little tip then, what I'd like you guys to do is to is to look at some of Bob's mixes, and you know, we were talking about reference tracks. Like I'm I'm a big fan of. Uh, I know Dave uses it as well, is Hey Soul Sister. I think Endo's mix on that is fantastic. He's got very controlled uh, top end. So take some of Bob's stuff and put it in your sessions mm -hmm. because even uh, Joe Zook was telling me that Rob Cavallo had made him uh, listen to a Jewel song ah. while mixing a Green Day track. Wow. And, and Zook was like, what are you talking about? And then what he was trying to say was like, you see the relationship between everything. And I think it's really... That kind of stuff is understanding the relationship. So even out of genre, yeah, I think it works really, really good. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's nothing wrong with using an R and B reference on a on a rock mix. It's it's what you know. You, you got to know your references. You, uh, it, what you don't have if if you have something new and you know it sounds great everywhere, you don't necessarily have to know it. But my, most of my references, they're not even within the last year. They're songs that I've known for even ten years. But I know give that. Us, give us some end. ideas of your references. Um, okay, so for one, for for bass drums, heavy bass drums, like in urban music, hip hop, uh, Eminem's The Business. Right. That ba bass drum is about as big as you can go without getting in trouble. Right. So I use that as kind of a, uh, a mark so I know where I can put mine and if I've gone too far or, or if I can keep going, you know. Um, but even just the overall EQ of something, if you, if you pull up, um, if you're working on, I don't know, a, uh, a female pop track, uh, pop rock track, but then you pull up a urban track that just has kind of an EQ spectrum that you like, that you want to kind of impart on the mix you're doing. That's okay. It doesn't have to be the same genre that you're referencing. It just has to, you just have to let your ears not get to that spot where you've been mixing eight hours without a reference and your mix is really dull and you don't know it because you haven't heard anything else. You know, even... Sometimes I'll flip on over to Netflix and watch an episode of something, just take an ear break, and just listening to that mixed TV, uh, you've kind of reset your ears, you know, mm -hmm. just talking to somebody. You know, it's like your ears are hearing something else than the mix you're working on. Wonderful. It can reset you. And That's and, a great tip. I know. like that. Yeah. Well, what can I say? Those are awesome <laughs> tips. Thank Thanks. you ever so much. I'll double outro, but hey, it was worth it. Thank you ever so much for watching. Please leave some questions and comments below. Subscribe, go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list. Thanks, Bob. See you guys later. Thanks.